Thank you for joining us today for this virtual fireside candid conversation around family finances and savings, building financial resilience in uh, a turbulent economic environment. Um, just the other day, I was listening to the BBC and they were saying the government is announcing that there is now a recession. How many recessions will the UK face? I don't know. All I know is it does not have to be the portion. My name is Sylvia Kalunji. I am the project lead and CEO for Women and Digital Inclusion, also known as Warden, an organization based here in the Northwest, in Merseyside. Our mission is to end digital poverty to engender social equity in our communities, especially Black migrant communities in Merseyside. Now, for those of you that know, we have some amazing SIM cards for ladies and young women who are facing data uh, challenges. We don't need to know your uh, financial status or whether your benefits or not. We just need to know that you genuinely are finding it difficult to have data on your phone. That's it. And we don't even really. Have you mentioned it. So, uh, Oscar, would you, would you mute yourself? Thank you. So, if you know somebody, if you are that, that, that person who needs a SIM card, it's loaded, preloaded with data, preloaded with airtime. Uh, we have those that are valid for six months, valid for 12 months, and valid for 24 months. You choose. Uh, but you need to reach out to Rachel Barbara. I think uh, she has a little purple uh, icon with an R in it. And uh, give her your details, and we will arrange for you to get one. So I'm very excited. This is our eighth, ninth session. We have been doing really well. We started in November, and uh, our focus is not on the problem but on the solutions or way forward so that we do, because what you focus on expands. And if you focus on the problem, I guarantee you, you find yourself faced with the problem over and over again. So we like to focus on the solution so that we can get more and more of what we are choosing, preferring, desiring, wishing for. The Lord is your shepherd, thou shalt not want. So I don't use that word, what do you want? Because that means what do you lack? And when you keep saying want, you keep lacking. But hey, that's a deep conversation. So. We have two amazing, amazing poverty warriors. Mm. <laughs> Today, I have the pleasure of introducing my sister, Barbara. She is the CEO and founder of Prosper Life Initiatives. This organization is all about supporting the woman, the black migrant, the bay woman from poverty, financial life, financial literacy, financial insecurity to a place where you can command your economy. She is all about microfinance, she's about uh, third sector finance, she's about women finance, she's going to pour into you regarding your family finances and savings. I cannot tell you how excited I am. To uh, some of you have had the opportunity of learning from Barbara. She gives and gives and then gives some more. I don't know, me, that's I like to connect with people like that. So if you don't have friends like that, you better connect with her because she's amazing. And she's also going to be helping you with your finances today if you stay with us on the other side of the scale i have the awesome awesome my mentor the reason warden exists mason rodson she is the ceo and founder of support and action for women's network best over there in beautiful greater manchester and so is barbara's prosper life initiative by the way this lady is also the founder of mama house and poverty partnerships like you hear these things these women are poverty warriors. They are all about stopping yeah. poverty in our community. Rose is all about uplifting the woman, uplifting the girl child, uplifting you in every way. If you're not connected to these two ladies, I don't know what you're looking for. So we're going to be listening from Barbara first, and then we'll be listening to Rose. Also, there is a mix of, they'll probably come in between as well. And along the way, we will have a, a, a small window for questions and answers, if time permits, because the way I know the way things go on this, on this platform, the Boy. questions, and we're asking questions, we are like, it's also already about six party, when are we ending this thing? But hey, ho, we will see how it goes. So I'd love for all of you to uh, mute yourself and unmute yourself when you're talking, asking a question, raise your hand digitally or physically if you want to ask something, please feel free. This is a safe space, uh, so feel free. Uh, to ask questions, to share your experiences, and to uh, share and engage. Uh, it's better when we are all engaging, right? 
So welcome you all. I'm very excited today. I'm going to shout out because I can talk for England, me. So Barbara, here's the button and here's the mic. Thank you and welcome. Wow, wow. Thank you so much for that explosive interview. Oh. I usually call myself a student because every I enjoy learning. Every place I go to, I always pick material to learn from. So I'm here as a student as well <laughs> to learn from everybody. There is always a lot of expertise in the room. Nice to meet everyone here. I think Julie has given uh, an explosive, inter an explosive in in intro. And I'm like, okay, I don't know if you're talking about me. But yeah. thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, we've worked together for quite some time on different yeah, in different spaces. So we always learn a lot from one another. I'm Manchester best, and I'm one of the mamas. You know, part of 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 of, of Mama Health and Poverty Partnership uh, with our founder Rose. So we work we've worked together for quite a long time. We've known each other for so so many years, and the passion of the work we do is because of part of the journeys we've walked over the years. So I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to learn. I'm happy to have an interactive session because, uh, you know, everybody always brings something on the table that we all pick on and take forward. And when it comes to money, we all have different experiences. They're never, it's never the same across the board, but one is experience always can be a solution to someone else's plight that they are going through at that point in time. So um, I don't know whether I should share a, a, a presentation because sometimes I'm like, even though I'm a teacher by profession, I'm a trained teacher, I kind of get cold feet when I go back to that classroom and I'm like, I'm in that learning environment. So uh, I'll make it as interactive as possible. Um, I can share the slides briefly, but it's more of an interactive uh, session where we are all walking this journey, especially with regards to cost of living uh, focus or crisis, call it whatever. But I think this has been, it's, it's been called different names at different times because pre-COVID, we were walking on a journey. Then came COVID with the lockdown. It was also another cost of living crisis. They didn't call it that way, but again, everything was impacting our money, our finances, our economy. Coming out of uh, uh, COVID, the energy crisis, you know, everything. I don't know what is coming next. That's mm -hmm. why the topic we are looking at of being resilient, I think it's something we've got to learn to live by because it is one thing after the other, but they call it a different name. So I, my sister Julia has just mentioned there the recent um, announcement about UK getting into recession and all that. They all look like economic terms, but they impact everybody at whatever level. So which means that we have to think outside the box. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we need to look towards the future in a positive way especially if we've got to live in with such uh, crises coming up from left and right. So I believe we've all been through it and we, we've all built some sort of resilience, but again, we can still learn from one another. I would be, it would be interesting to hear members share how they've thrived all through post COVID, post lockdown, because at the end of the day, when you look at the bank accounts, almost everybody was impacted in one way or another. But we all thrived and survived by taking different measures. So it's not one size fits all. So I'm happy to be here. And my 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 colleague Rose will co-present because I think at the start of these sessions, she talked about resilience. And that is the general resilience from day to day. It's not any different when it's coming to finances. So uh, if you're happy, uh, Julie, I can do a brief sharing of the slides if it is really necessary. And then we take it on from there. Be nice. That would be nice. Um, you're a co-host, so you can screen share. Um, and, and yeah, take it okay. away. 
with our theme for the day, still looking at cost of living, not any different from all the other sessions that have preceded this one, because they all focus on how we can survive through, how we can thrive through the times that we are moving in, which are still continuous. So today we still continue with the cost of living focus, but specifically looking at building our financial resilience. And I believe everybody has some sort of resilience that they've established over this period of time that we have been going through. Uh, I love, I came across this quote, if you're not staying on top of your money, you're putting your financial well-being at risk. Well-being is a terminology that is being used in almost every space, and it applies to many aspects of life. Not any different when we think about finances, because everything, again, impacts on our finances at the end of the day, and there is a effect, again, even on our physical health, when our financial well-being is not on top as it should. So this quote says it all that when we look at our finances or money, I usually use the, the, the terminology money matters because finance is a bit scary. It's a scary, it's so much of uh you know unofficial term, but all we are talking about is money. So we need to make sure that we are on top of this journey. It's beginning of the year. This is 2024. Personally, I usually do my stock taking in January because I need to focus and reflect on the year ahead. There are bills I can't avoid. There are things I can't avoid. Then there are those I feel I need to add on my to-do list if at all I'm able to achieve them with the finances that I have. So usually January, February, the first quarter of the year, mm -hmm. personally, is the best time from my own personal experience where I do get to reflect on the aspects of finances for the rest of the year. And the environment, the, the general environment around, again, determines how far or how, how, you know, how much I'm able to reflect on that journey for the rest of the year. So usually, depending mm -hmm. on how you plan your, your your outgoings, there are bills that are usually coming up at the beginning of the year, be it council tax. You know, they tell us the bills in advance that are going to kind of uh, spread throughout the year. And sometimes that is the best time to start planning. And as plan, obviously, we are looking at our bank accounts and not where do we start and how do we do it? So financial resilience, like the terminology itself, is the ability to adapt and bounce back from the financial setbacks. We could have had financial setbacks in 2023. This is 2024. It doesn't stop us moving forward because the failures, the challenges become part of our learning tools for the next level, for the next steps that we have to take. So we don't only focus on than now, but we are looking at the future, at the future, but again reflecting on the past. We've looked at how everything has kind of skyrocketed because of inflation. That means it's not anytime soon that costs are going to go low. They either remain constant, or if not, they slightly go above. So, whatever is out there, we know we are in the long haul for it because what lies ahead we may not be able to determine what factors are at play because they are affecting every country globally, not only here in England. So when we talk about cost of living, if you have people in other countries, I think everybody is saying the same thing, the cost of living, the prices, the food prices, and everything is just out of the norm. So we just have to put on our seatbelts and ride the journey along the way and be more prepared so we need to have those strategies, those plans to navigate those sudden financial shocks or those money shocks that will come along the way. As we've said, it's not kind of um, it's not kind of slowing down. But since COVID, we see one crisis after another, one crisis after another, prices going up, 
prices kind of almost tripling from the norm that we were used to. And these are prices we cannot do without. These are expenses we cannot do without. So we need to think on our feet, not only as individuals, but then as a family. Because if you look at the flyer, we are looking at family finances. So it's not in isolation. If we didn't know how to work together, then I think this is the time where we are changing our mindset and realize, you know what, if I'm to choose to go into debt, automatically it's going to affect everybody that is part of my family. Reason being, there are things we'll have to forego. If I choose to pay off debts now, again, it's going to impact the wider family because there are things we'll have to forego and put aside in order to kind of sell, sell through. This is another quote that I came across. Start where you are, use what you have and do what you can. And that goes to our finances. It's never about too much. It's never about too little. It is all about using what you have. And that is our journey where we need to start from, to plan ahead, to kind of get everything in place, to be able to sail whatever may come ahead. So this quote is a point of reflection. And in order to kind of look at the bigger picture as we build our financial resilience, definitely there are key aspects we look at. Our incomes, we look at our expenses, we look at our savings, we look at our debts. We also look at our giving. I, I didn't include it here, but it's part and parcel of the journey. It doesn't matter whether you're giving in your local church, whether you're giving in your other place of worship, be it a mosque, whether you're giving your family, your wider family, giving is part and parcel of our nature. So even as we look at financial resilience, our giving is also impacting other people who are benefiting from the strategies that we have in place because it's not about to stop anytime soon. So as we start on the journey of that reflection, we look at our incomes. How have we thrived during the past year or the past seasons that we've gone through? When COVID came locked down, so many jobs were impacted. So many people had to be laid off. So many people had to stay home. Our work culture suddenly changed where we were not free to go to whatever places and whatever business you are doing. Is it going to change? I don't think so much has changed since because certain things really there was a round in the way we operate, in the way we work. Yes, we might be doing homeworking in terms of getting off out of the office spaces and working from home. What does that mean in terms of our incomes? Are you self-employed? Are you working for an organization? What is the impact in terms of your incomes as a result of working from home? Some organizations have had to take that, that approach because it's saving them money. And that means less pay. That also means less costs that they are incurring, but again, it is impacting their survival. Do, are we going to have these jobs for the next short term or long term? These are things we reflect on because times are just changing quick. We don't know what is coming in the next few months, in the next years. All we know is there is no light at the end of the tunnel yet. It is one thing after another. And at the end of the day, it hits back our bank accounts. It hits back how we live our lives, how we plan our lives. It is never like it used to be then because the disposable income now we have is getting more, less and less because of the things that are happening around us. So we need to think on our feet because sometimes I remember years ago when you talk of business, you ask yourself, I am not that sort of person who can do business because that terminology itself scares you off. You when, you when people talk about business, you think about this other huge business and all that. But then times have changed. There are so many. Everybody can be a business person. Depends what business you choose to do. And we all look at the skills we have. And that's what we need to reflect on as we try 
to see how we are going to maneuver in the times ahead. Currently, yes, we could be surviving, we could be in survival mode, we could be in thrival mode, but then our next steps are more important than where we are today. So we need to explore what is out there. Can we have a side hustle in order to boost our incomes? Is that paycheck that's coming in enough to last you the next few months, just in case things turn around? Are you able to meet all your expenses? What options are out there? My sister Julie is 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 the star in the internet, the tech aspect of things and how you can exploit tech to boost your incomes. There's so much there. As long as we are willing to step out, learn a new trade, learn something new, use it to be able to plan ahead. We can no longer thrive or survive on what is being paid to us on a monthly basis because COVID time showed us that, you know what, these jobs can end suddenly. Even though we are in an environment where there is that boost coming in, sometimes you, you're not employed, so you can go and maybe get benefits and all that. But I, as when we look where we have been, we don't have that certainty that things will always be like that, that there will always be something available to sustain us during any times that may happen. If you've read the news, they talk of disease X, worse than what we've seen. And then you're asking yourself, okay, what does that mean? What is the implication of that? What if it is tomorrow? Why are they talking about it over and over again? You know, we no longer take things for granted, but all these kind of make us sit upright and say, you know what? I think I better think ahead. I think they are hammering this thing over and over again. You flip the news, disease X, and then you're like, what next is coming? How are we going to be prepared financially? Are we going to survive? Are we going to thrive? Or we are going to be worse off than we were back then? That is food for thought for each and every one of us. I, I strongly believe we are in times where we need to think on our feet, where, where we need to look at the bigger picture because it impacts all of us. It impacts our communities. It impacts cities. It impacts everybody like we have seen. You know, we all managed to go through that season because everybody was leaning onto another to support. Whether it was a food parcel coming through that doorstep, it made a difference. It didn't matter what, how much you had. If you went to the early times when you went to the supermarket and you were only suited to buy only two items, it meant whether you had a family of eight in your household or whether you were alone or two people, you all had the same measure that is, was being handed out to you in terms of what you could bring home. It didn't matter what you needed to spend on, but at the end of the day, you needed that money to be able to go out and be able to put food on the table and be able to pay the bills. The bills never changed. In any case, they went up because we were more at home, consuming more electricity, more gas, more water, and everything. If you look at your bill during that time, if you observe it critically, it went up. Why? Some expenses, it was inevitable. We had to spend more, like it or not. So that means preparation is always key. Can we get part-time work? Can we utilize the skills and needs to make money? What do you have in your hands? That is why you start thinking, what else can I use to ensure that I maximize my income? Investments. I think uh, uh, I think it was Rehma who was talking about investments. You know, what is out there that we can fall back to in times of crisis that we do not have to struggle. When you go at when you look at your assets, are they protected? Are you aware what insurance is out there that you can get to have you covered for your health, your property, your income? I remember during the I remember during the lockdown I could not access uh, a dentist because suddenly. I realized I had been 
taken off the register because I hadn't appeared for the last two years or so. For some reason, you have to appear there. And I was in deep, deep pain at, the, at that time. There was no slot available. I tried to call the 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 NHS line for that. I still could not. The waiting list and the waiting times were very, very high. And here I couldn't sleep for days. But I already had insurance coverage. So that the only option that was available, even though extracting just one tooth cost 350 pounds, which I thought was ridiculous, but there was no other option. There was no other option. I remember I had to use a credit card to make that payment because I was in so much pain and I wasn't sleeping. So I had to make sure that I use part of my health cover to be able to pick up on that bill. So practically, we had to share it halfway. I had to look for the half half, half, half bill and pay it off. And then the other half, the insurance paid, paid it, pay, 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 paid up. So some of these things we take for granted, but at the end of the day, if you explore and know what is available out there and you pay that small fee, never know when it comes handy when you're in need. So we need to educate ourselves on what is available there because we don't know when we are going to need it. But I think these are the times where we need to make sure that whatever is on the table, we critically look at it and see how it's going to benefit us in the short and longer term. Mm -hmm. Your property, you know, there are things that we use day to day, washing machines and all that. You can ensure some of those things. That is part of building your financial resilience because you know when there is any breakdown and you don't have money to buy the actual appliance at that time, that insurance cover comes in handy because at that time you're able to get something new, something that you need, but at almost no cost because of the little deposits you've been paying over mm -hmm. the period of time. That that came in too. That came that happened for us. We had our fridge freezer went. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the insurance was a great help. Yeah, That's when we realized how. Yeah, it, it, it was it was good to insure your 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 appliances. Yeah, I think for years I've insured the washing machine because I'm a mom of four. So when it comes to washing, we are almost washing continuously. But every time it breaks down as it does, they come in. They do the repairs. If it needs replacement, we've not had to pay a single cent. But that small bits we pay over every month have come in handy for the last 10 years or so. And these are things, you know, somehow we had to find out. We had to research to be able to ensure that some of those appliances they are catered for. During lockdown, we had the same issue with the fridge. It also went, you know. And we had to make sure that it is replaced again using that, uh, using our insurance provider. Emergency fund funds. I mean, this is something we need to all start thinking about. As I mentioned, the initial quote, start where you are, start with what you have. It's never too little. It is never too much. But we need to build this over a period of time because it is our safety net, regardless of what we are going through at the moment. So it is a habit we need to build in order to ensure that when those times come, at least we have a fallback position. And again, when we have those, when we will maximize our incomes through different channels, it makes it easier to be able to kind of build some of these emergency fund, funds that we may need in future as we go along. Just setting aside a portion, depending on how much you have, it is a habit that we need to build as part and parcel of our day-to-day -day living. As soon as we get our income, whether it is a side hustle we are going to use to build that emergency fund, and I think that would be a good, a good, a, a good idea just to get that side hustle to build that fund, even if it is for six months, as long as it is available and you're able to use it to get some sort of income, 
then it can help build some of these pots of funding that may be beneficial in the future or in the shorter or long term as we go along. You know, it's usually recommended that we need to save at least three to six months worth of living expenses, which is becoming more and more difficult given the seasons we've been walking in. That means that sometimes we may have to take that extra risk and look for another part-time job and plan accordingly. I mean, you can do your own calculations. How much do I need to save from maybe this part-time role? It doesn't matter whether at the moment I have a full-time job, but if I can have a, a, a side hustle or another part-time income for the next six months and you do your calculations and you know that once I'm done within the next six months, I've built that emergency funding and it's going to help me survive through the times ahead. This is always a good practice for each and every one of us to ensure that as individuals, as families, we have this fallback position because it's not something that is easy. It takes a lot of discipline. It takes a lot of resilience to determine that, you know what, come rain or shine, this is what I'm going to start doing. It's not been part and parcel of me, but I'm going to start looking at some of those options to ensure that I'm self-reliant in the next mid or long midterm mid as we as as we you know as we explore even other options that may be on the table that we need to adapt. We need to try to manage our expenses as much as we can. I already mentioned that there are bills at this point in time that are getting more and more ridiculous because they are not at any time getting lower. They are actually getting higher, looking at electric bill, gas bills, water bills. Every bill that comes in now is almost doubling the previous one. And then you really wonder what is really happening. You haven't changed anything in your household, but the bills themselves are still going up. You try to minimize all these non-essential expenses in order to focus on the essential expenses or priority expenses. But at the same time, it leaves, it leaves you with less in your bank. And then you kind of struggle to pay for the next bill. And that is when you empty maybe even all your savings because everybody is at your door. They want their bill paid off as soon as possible. We need to learn to shop wisely. I think we all had a bit of a lesson during 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 uh, lockdown. That's when we realized you can survive a year without buying a new shoe. And it is very, very okay. You can survive a, <laughs> a year without buying a new dress. You can survive a year without, you know. And then when you looked around in your household, you realized you have things that you've never touched for years, but much as you bought them. I think time for lockdown was time for decluttering for those who had the opportunity it was one way of maintaining your mental health and getting something actively doing with the kids or as a family and then you realized what are all these things doing in the house when you try to add up you realize you don't even want to think about it because it is money that has just been gone down the drain so we need to be aware of those little expenses a small leak will sink a great ship. That was a quote by Benjamin Franklin. It doesn't matter whether it is 50p and you can't save it on an emergency fund. Only speaking, we take all this for granted, but sometimes we cannot put it even on our emergency account. Or our manager in the house, but it's it's easy to go and spend it there. So I believe those are the lessons we learned from some of these seasons. There is always the positives out of the negatives. And those are the lessons we learn and help us to become better as we move along. So the expenses, I can't go into the details. That was another session we had, how to minimize them. And you know, I'm just being generic. Because all these things are points of reflection as we build our financial resilience, managing our debts. We need to ensure that we 
get on top of this, even as we move along. Why? Because as the economy gets more, you know, as they talk of recession and everything that comes with it, we know that we get less and less money in our bank accounts because of what is happening around the environment we are in. And debt usually becomes one of the biggest burden that we carry along the way. If you've never been in debt, count yourself lucky. But I know how hard it is to work your way out of the debt. It is sometimes it is not that easy because the, the other expenses still remain as you plan for that debt. But again, this is the time to reflect on some of these things because we, we are not sure of what is happening tomorrow. But with debts, the creditor will always come to your door. Like it or not, they want their money. Whether it is a credit card, whether it is a bill, whether it is something you've tied yourself into for the long run, you need to think on your feet, how do I get out of debt? Especially in the times we are in. Ensure that you communicate with your creditors. If you are in debt, look at the interest rates. How much are we paying? Credit cards. You can pay for a credit card for years and years. If you're not, if you don't have a, a, a strategy in place to clear rid of at the earliest possible time, can you consolidate your debts so that you reduce your monthly payments and then you're able to kind of plan your way around it? Are you able to negotiate? But again, have a repayment plan. The shorter the repayment plan, the easier it will get because of the times we are in. Be paying off debts has to be so intentional like all everything else around us. Why? Because the debts keep eating into our income. Day to day, you work, you work, but then when you look at what you're paying out in, in, in debts, sometimes... It is covering almost everything you're earning and you're left with very, very little to manage or to live on. So we need to ensure that if we have debts, it's time to plan. We need to ensure that we avoid getting as much as possible into new debt. Why? Because we don't know what is coming next. We don't know the times that are ahead. I remember during lockdown because of everything that was happening around us as a as a family when we realized you know what i think we can plan to get out of debt because these are debts that were hanging around for years and years and then we realized you know what we are in lockdown kids are home they're not going to school do we need to pay for that extra insurance for for that car do we need to it's very, very important. Mm -hmm. And this is okay. Do we need everything that we are suddenly having at our doorstep? Or we can strategize to determine that you know what? Now that we are home, or now that this is the kind of lifestyle we are living, let's think on our feet and get rid of some of these debts. And it became a lifesaver. It didn't get all cleared. But with that in mind, it helped us make a leap. And eventually you could feel that breathing space that you know what? At least I have this credit card out of the way. At least I have, you know, being intention one by one. I remember I even didn't use this approach of the high interest first. I used the smallest first because it was easier to get rid of the small ones and then finally, you're left with the bigger ones that usually have the higher interest rates. But nevertheless, that was the strategy which worked easily because we knew if we can put one and one together and put it on the table, then that two is cleared off. Then we go to the next one because when you look around as families, you get one date after the other. Sometimes it is inevitable. But whether we like it or not, they've got to be cleared off. So we need to have a strategy in place. Um, crisis management. You know, I've been mentioning that from, from the start. I think we all have to get into this kind of mode because we are in a crisis moment. 
like it or not. Things have not changed. If any, if not, they've become worse for families, for individuals. So we need to put on our thinking hat that whatever they whatever is planned ahead, whether what they mention in the papers, whether it is the recession, we have our crisis management hats on. Reason being, they impact us directly as individuals, as families, they impact everybody around you. So we always have that thinking hat on, how are we going to go through that season in case it comes? Because that season we've been through trained us, it happened suddenly. No one prepared for it. There is no one who prepared for lockdown because it was, we had never seen it in our lifetime, some of us. It was something new, but impacting everybody. And everybody has to go through it. Sickness came, everything came at our doorstep. At the end of the day, we needed to survive through, we needed to thrive through. So it has changed our thinking pattern that you know what, these things can happen anytime. So we have to be always prepared come rain or shine, get support. They are financial advisors. Here they have to be regulated. Be mindful who you're going to for financial advice. They need to be experts. They need to be licensed. Otherwise, you can get the wrong advice and then you ditch yourself further. That is very key. They are credit counselors. They are those who are free in organizations that are on. I think one of the sessions we delivered here, they had a list of some of those places where you can get that free information, but it is available for everybody. Again, it is to help you get stronger with managing your finances. Networking events, what we are doing right now are all learning platforms. Support groups, they are available out there. Every little adds up, every little adds up because at the end of the day, it is it becomes part of your strategy for the next level. Talking to someone, Sometimes we suffer in silence because we don't know where to get the support we need. We don't know where to start from, but start where you are. Start with what you have. It will always make a difference. The most important thing is for you to take action. Your financial wellness is like your health wellness because once the finances are in tatters, most likely even your health will be affected. Your mental health, your physical health, why you're thinking a lot, stress, everything is not adding up. But again, you have to survive. There are people who are looking up to you for the next meal, for the next bill. They are all looking up to you. So we need to ensure that we are mindful day to day. Let us stay informed. Research, the internet is full of resources. You can never, I know there is information overload, but you can be tactical depending on what you're looking out for. Budget, budget. We need to learn. It's not about figures. It is about being prepared. It's about knowing that what I have can see me through tomorrow, can see me through next week. Do your own financial checkup. It's like a health checkup. You have your bank account. You manage it. You know what is going out. You know what is going in. Take time to think through it. It is Sometimes it's easier to close our eyes and we spend, spend. But at the end of the day, it will still catch up. We have to have that positive mind, mindset regarding how well we want our finances to be, like even our personal health. Because when our financial health is leaking, most likely there will be leaks through our health as well, our physical health. So we need to make sure that we are on top. Always remember, involve and educate the children and the young adults on this journey in terms of managing money. We need to incorporate that as part of our culture. We didn't grow up with that kind of thinking, but in the times we are in, they need to come on board. They need to learn that money does not grow on trees. Someone has to work for it and somebody has to first think before they spend because it is also a generation that is moving. As soon as they get out, they are in debt. They are living in debt. Everything is debt, 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 debt. But the more they are informed, 
the easier it is. And charity begins at home. Education begins in our own household. They need to be involved in every process that we are doing. Yes, our parents may never may not, never have told us how much money they had in the bank. You don't need to tell them how much money you, <laughs> you have in the bank, but they need to know how you get it and how you maintain it so that they pick on the tips that will enable them thrive as they move along in life. So financial resilience is a continuous journey. It involves planning, taking action, discipline, and staying informed. We cannot shy away from learning. I'm keen to hear from everybody else how they are moving around with this journey as we've been going through the times we've been through. Thank you so much. Be blessed. I have a lot of information. I have a lot of questions, but um, they are all around um, kind of like signposting. Um, for instance, you've mentioned uh, financial advisors and credit counselors. Um, you mentioned uh, uh, you mentioned uh, all these amazing resources. I am hoping that we will have uh, some kind of uh, signposts who, who we can or which organizations or which persons we can reach to for those conversations because where I grew up and the schools I went to, we were ne not given this. We were not given this kind of uh, guidance. We were not given this kind of education. It's not given in universities. I don't know which school does it apart from, I don't know, special, special school. So we all need this kind of guidance and we also need encouragement to utilize these resources because as as a, an African British, black British, as they like to call us, um, I, I, I shy away from these things because I, I feel like, hey, how do I expose my ignorance to somebody? But it is that fear that's keeping us in a state of luck, in a state of, uh, you know, uh, uh, cycles of poverty and cycles of, of debt because we we do not do certain things. One of the things that I learned way later in life was uh, putting aside a portion of my income every month for uh, for better planning and for investing. I, I am one of those people who don't believe in putting aside money for a rainy day. We live in Britain, it rains every day. So I, I believe in putting it aside to invest in something that's going to produce that what they call residual income because we have residual bills that are as in monthly bills. And so we need to create monthly income outside of that paycheck from an employer because, as you said, uh, the employer is not obliged to keep you on uh, for whatever reason. So it is always important to have a side income, side hustle, side gig, you call it what you want, home business, whatever. But everybody must have something outside of there. In fact, your job is supposed to be your investor. That paycheck is supposed to be used to invest and do something that builds your financial resilience. And so we Black people need to get out of there, go to school, get good grades, get a job, and then get that paycheck and live off that paycheck because most people live on more money than money because of that mentality. And so we have to get out of that space and become the thriving, thrival, I had a new word to get, thrival mode, as opposed to survival mode. So I don't know if any, so, uh, we've ha we have several comments, but they are all amazing. We're all in the same boat. Thank you so much for such knowledge. This is timely. Uh, have yeah. a couple of questions. Um, I've, 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 you know, someone was asking about the insurance for 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 low income earners yes health insurance I, yeah i think they I've, I've been with the same insurer for quite some time i used nice. to use simply health actually one of the first jobs when i came uh in the uk okay. was mm -hmm. providing that as part of their their benefit for the for the for the for the workers mm. so i went on it and i've never changed i know you can shop around Mm. and do your research and there are quite a couple of them out there but it has been beneficial because I remember even when I gave birth to my kids they mm. would still pay you know I, I, by that time it was 150 pounds for every child born you know so it's been helpful over the years when it happened that during lockdown I mm. didn't have a dentist I had to use a private you know uh, actually an emergency dental practice I just Googled it online because I couldn't get a dentist anywhere. 
and just extracting one tooth was 350 pounds. There is no way I could have been able to afford it because that was the only option available. But I knew that insurer at least pays up to 100 pounds in terms of, of, of the cover that I'm on. I mean, you can determine which level you want. I used to, I to be on the basic and it's been quite helpful over the years. So that, that helped me a lot. The other thing I forgot to mention was for the self-employed. And again, it's from personal experience mm. because we forget to put money aside for our taxes. Mm. And when you're doing your returns, when the bill finally comes in, you realize, oh, I've got to pay thousands of pounds. You need to ensure that when you get that income in, at least put aside 20% as a matter of practice because chances are that almost 20% of what you've earned, you'll have to pay to the tax man. And this is something you have to put aside for every piece of income that you're getting as a self-employed because you can be self-employed you can also be employed it doesn't matter but again you've got to fulfill your obligations as you go along and that money has to be put aside so when we are thinking of side hustles we also need to think about the tax man if we are thinking of the passive income we also need to think about the, the tax man because they need their portion as well and we and we need to imagine oh, are you, are you there? yeah, yeah. Thank you. Imagine. Yeah. And then there was a question about good debt. I was posting the questions because people post them to me directly as opposed to asking them openly. So then I post them again. Uh, so uh, someone was saying, can, can't we take on good debt like a mortgage? So I posted it publicly again. Yeah. Was it from you? <laughs> no. Because I already have mortgages and okay. I don't consider them a yeah. challenge, especially a buy to let for yeah. commercial purposes. I consider yeah. those good because they are they are assets as opposed to draining out of your pocket. As long as you explore what is happening in the economy at the moment, because we all know what has been happening behind the scene, including repossessions. Mm. So it is good to do your research. Mm -hmm. Is it the best time to buy? Is it the mm -hmm. best time to sell? So mm -hmm. all those are market forces that are at play, which have no right or wrong answer until you get the right advice. So always make sure you do your homework mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. there are also many people who have had to lose homes because of what is happening around us. So it's not a guarantee. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then there's someone who's asking, when your loans are consolidated, doesn't it affect your credit? Consolidated loans and credit. Again, I have no idea about that. Again, it it it's one, it also depends on the advice you've got and the strategy. I've done debt consolidation, but the way we did it was we got we got uh, we, we kind of lumped calculated all the loans we the debt we had together and realized we could find a cheaper lender to lend us and we pay a smaller installment while we while we use that same money to clear off all what we had owing and it helped so again you need to explore the options that are available some I think of, I think someone wants to know what's consolidating your loan. So, so that's again that's in yeah. their term. So yeah. again, when you use credit counselors, they will give you the different options and the implication to your credit rating. I'm not a debt advisor, so I only provide provide education, but they are experts in the different places who are able to give you all the wider options and they will frankly tell you the impact on your credit rating or any other future lending opportunities that you may you may need because of the decision you have taken. So it is always important to get the right advice from the right people. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's what I can say around that. There are options you can explore for yourself and get head on with it. Mm -hmm. But then there are other options where you feel 
you don't have an immediate solution. You really need an expert to give you further information on the different steps you need to take. Debt is quite a wide topic, the different options that are available. And that is a different session in terms of education. There is no way we can we can we can we can start on it right here. But there are different options available. But I always say if you feel your debts are enormous, try to get the right advice because it can impact your future dealings if you make the wrong choice of approach. Oh. Right. Woo! On that note, ladies and gentlemen, we have some gentlemen on here. You've heard from the finance expert. Um, so sometimes you can think, oh, I knew that already. But are you doing it? Is mm -hmm. the question. Uh, because to build resilience, it's like going to the gym. If you want to have those sexy pecs you and then sexy abs, you go and build, build until they become, until you have that six pack. So it is a daily journey and a daily do that gets us to where we need to be financially. So I have, I think we've exhausted the questions. Uh, there's a lot of feedback. Thank you for this amazing knowledge is power. Learn something new. So, and if there are no more questions, we're going to pass the mic to the amazing other sister who's going to be supporting our journey to financial resilience and family savings, Mrs. Rose Sally. For those of you that are a bit late, she is the CEO and founder of Support and Action for Women's Network, an organization that supports the well-being, the thriving of the Black migrant woman and woman child in Greater Manchester. She is an amazing mentor. She can literally help you to get out of your head and get into your heart and serve with soul. That's what she did to me because I was very commercial. Now I'm serving like a consultant of God. So I'm very, 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 very honored to introduce our poverty warrior, Mrs. Rose Sally, uh, to share with us today as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mrs. Barbara Andrea, for giving us, pouring into us. For me, what I've learned is there are several things I'm not doing. I'm going to be doing. I'm going to look at the slides and do. Uh, the slides will be available on our hub and uh, our amazing project admin will put the link in the chat so you can visit that hub and find the slides there in the next few days. Not immediately, but definitely in the next few days. And if you haven't downloaded the prior sessions, pop on over after. Don't all go at once and go do the stuff. So welcome, Mrs. Rose Sally. We are very excited to hear from you and to learn from you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, th thank you so much, um, Julie and Wardin, for always welcoming us on this platform. And thank you, my dear Bab my dear sister Barbara, for always educating me and scaring me to death. <laughs> so, and I always learn from anything you share. Yeah. So, and I've learned you no know, additional income streams, side hustles, everything you've said I've taken on board and it always adds a different perspective. So, um, just to add on to what my sister Barbara has said, when we think of rich people, because I've got a son who is 16 and he's always thinking, when you ask him rich people, he thinks he's always, he knows them, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, Bill Gates, Dangote, he will tell you how much money they have and what they're doing and all the time. So, and he said he'll, he'll become rich one day. He has to become rich. How he's going to do it, I don't know, but he promises. And, and one of the promises is to buy me a big white house. So I'm looking forward to that. But I just want to add practicalities on what Barbara has said. And one of the things that affects us, and I'm assuming majority of you here are Black African. I can tell from the names, sisters from different countries. And one of the things that we need to look at is our background. One of the things we need to consider seriously, when you sit down, when you go home, when you're already home, think about your childhood. What was money like when you were growing up? It has a serious impact on your relationship with money. I've seen people who had a lot of money and it went suddenly. There's been people who are like the widow in, uh, is it 
uh, uh, somewhere in the Bible and she had a little, but it never ran out. There are people who have that kind of money. And then there are those who are always broke, but surviving. So there's always, there's, everybody has a different relationship with money. And just look back and see what relationship you have with money or your parents had with money. Very, very important and key to what we become with money. So how was it for you? How was it for you? Did you Are you a product of parents who had jobs, two jobs, two steady incomes coming in and just adding on, you know, setting out a budget, this is what you have to spend, and they worked and worked and worked and retired? Or are you a product of hustlers? Yeah, me, I'm a product of hustlers. My mom had a job. My When she passed away, my sister had a job. But on the side, we used to make so many things. We used to take uh, snacks. We used to make snacks in the night. And in the morning, before going to school, drop them off in little canteens, pick up the money in the evening. Uh, we used to rear chicken. We used to have pigs. So what was your relationship with money growing up? Some mm -hmm. people were lucky. They, were, they had pocket money. I, when I was in university, I had a job. I had a side hustle. I was teaching when I was in university in Uganda. So we need to look at our relationship with money and our history because it plays a big role in the decisions we make in the future. Seriously, it seriously plays a big role in what we do. And we know it impacts on what you eat, where you live, and this is your history. So we are products of where we were born. Some people were born into families that had land. So they were born rich. Others were born in a kazigo, which is a small, small room. Nothing, to, it's not your fault. But that was your start with money. And are we still in that mental state with money? Have we learned from it? Are we moving on? Where are you with money is a big question. So I'm going to leave to, we'll share later on, but I just want you to start thinking of your relationship with money. So um, I also want to, when you look at the relationship with money, we need to be honest and recognize where we are at. How much have I got in the bank? How much have I got in the bank? How am I using it? Am I spending? Am I, because some people say, I don't want to look like my problems. I'll buy designer clothes. But your problems are there. Can you afford your lifestyle? Seriously. Because you cannot walk on tiptoes. At one point, you fall back on your feet. So how are you relating with money? Are you honest with yourself? So that's, that's one thing we need to think about. And we need to be realistic. Some people are big dreamers. I am a big dreamer. I am a big dreamer. I dream big. But also, much as I love dreaming, I also live in the real world. I know what I can afford and what I can't afford. And Barbara mentioned bringing family in, relationships. Tell your children, your children need to see the real you. What can you afford? There are some things my children can never dare ask because they know they'll never get it. And there are some things, <laughs> there are some things that they know. They, oh, can, mommy, can we afford this? Is a good way to go as opposed to making demands because they know we have an honest relationship around money. So the other thing that Barbara has talked about, if you want to be financially resilient, we need to start where we are. What have you got? What have you got? If we look at two people I look at in the Bible, Moses, God said to him, what have you got in your hand? And he said, I've got a stick. So those miracles started with that stick, turning into a whatever, and then back into a stick and to a snake. And you know the story of Moses. It started with what he has in his hand. Then the other little boy in the Bible who had fish, if that little boy hadn't come out with his two fish and three loaves, there would have been no miracle. Seriously. Because if, you're, if, you're, if your mentality is, Jesus has said who has food, I only have two fish for myself, and he kept quiet. There would have been no miracle. 5,000 people wouldn't have been fed. But he came and said, this is what I have. And for me, that's the perspective I want us to take. What have I got in my hand? Let me start there. So my hand might not meet your physical hand. It might mean what you have in your head. What can you sell? What can you do? So many of us from Africa, we've been raised. And again, it's not our fault, really. It has to do with 
colonialism, it has to do with capitalism and so many other things. We've been, we focus so much on the white collar jobs to the point that when we come to this country, people despise, what are you doing? I see clips on TikTok. I saw one the other day and this boy was selling, you know, um, Uber Eats. And when he saw his friend, he threw away his food quickly to hide. And his friend was telling him, you know what? I'm, I live off this. It makes me money. So whatever your hustle is, be proud of it. Because at the end of the day, it feeds you. And at the end of the day, the money that comes out of cleaning toilets is not, it has, doesn't have a different color from that white collar job that you, you, you're dreaming about. So yes, it's good to have a job. However, you can't become rich with a job, just a job. You can never. You, can, you need a side hustle. You need to start thinking, what else can I do? If you can make food, if you can make chapati, whatever you can make to top up your job is good. And whatever money comes out of that, however little, it is still something. So the other thing I want to talk about is um, we need to invest wisely. Now, when I talk about investment, it might not even be just money. Invest your time. Some people, I can speak for my sister, uh, Rosemary here from Warden. When I first met Rosemary, she had come to attend an event. Then she's volunteering. I don't know her journey now with Warden, but it is there. It's a big journey. Rosemary is working with Warden. So she's invested her time. And who knows? It might turn into a job. Who knows? It's a it has already turned into a job. I don't know. Many people who have walked the own journey with us who started as people with a need, then they became volunteers. Now five women are employed by son because they invested their time. Now it is paying back. And they've got other jobs. So this is a, a second hustle. So the other thing, uh, of course, you not know, talking about investing money is a big thing. We need to understand what we are investing in. We need to understand what we're investing in, especially we are far from home. We don't understand the investments here. You need, like Barbara mentioned, be wise. Get somebody who can advise you. Don't call me because I won't be able to advise you on that. You need to, if you're buying a house, you need to understand exactly what it means. I can give you an example. As a charity, we just bought our first house. Me being me, I thought, oh, here is a house. It's for women. Women move in. That's not how it works. One, you have to turn it into a house of multiple occupancy. That's money. So, so far we are just spending, spending, spending on the legalities. Did I know that? No, I didn't. And I'm, or to be honest, I'm glad I didn't. Because if I did, maybe who knows, we didn't have got the house. So at the moment, we are getting uh, fire whatevers. They are going to put uh, fire resistance, something in the ceiling. All that. We don't know how much it's going to cost, but I'm thinking... An extra 20k, which we didn't plan for, which we didn't know. So that's that's something you need to understand. Whether you're investing, you need to understand where, where am I putting my money? Then the other thing is social investment. Make friends with people like Julie. Make friends with people like Barbara. That's what I've done. They are my friends. And not oh, well, just well, not just good friends, but they're adding value to me as a person, but to son as well. So invest properly. Because they, they, if you invest with people who just wake up and, well, I don't know how to say gossip, it's a big word. People who just have chat after chat, TikTok after this, they're not adding anything to you. Make social investments with people that can lead you to. Because I know now if I call Barbara today, now after this meeting, she can lend me 50 pounds. And Julie will lend me 50 pounds. And I, I know at least my friends are 50 pounders. <laughs> I can get, <laughs> I can get Audrey 50 pounds, honestly, like that. You know, I, can, I can, yeah, well, and more. So I know I've got friends who can lend. If I wanted 5k tonight, I'm sure I'll get it by the end of the night. And I'm serious. Why? It's because I, I know people who I'm investing my time in, who are investing their time in me. We talk about the same things. So um, then the other thing I wanted to add on is learn and study your environment. Yeah. So if you want to 
change your financial outlook. What is missing where I live? What is missing? What can I add? If I know um, somebody, so, so now, now like in Oldham, I know there's been a barbers for years because I've been here for 20 years. And in that barbers, I've noticed there's a young girl there who's doing hair now. So she's studied the environment and seen that mothers who bring in sons are likely to have daughters as well, or women. Who, so she's 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 invested. She's so she's talked to the Baba who has given um her space. So now she has a business. I don't know what how she does it or whatever, but very proud of that young girl for seeing things that way. If you're a caterer, what is missing? What can you do? How can you look out for who needs your food? How can you package it? Who can you sell it to? How can you market yourself? How do you start a business? All those things are things that you need to be thinking on on a daily. And what about if you can't sell a physical item? What skill? What skill can you sell? Think of a skill you can create. There are some people who have good voices. There are some people who are good um, seamstresses. They can sew, they can stitch. They, whatever you can do, what can you add on what you already do? Because I'm I'm thinking of somebody who's already doing something. And most of us are parents, so that's already one big job. And what else can you add on that and be a good example to your children? So the other big thing that I think we all agree on is the connections with our home countries. If we are to understand how to grow financially resilient, we need to have a good relationship with where we come from. Most of the times we want to impress people in Africa. In Uganda, you, people who come from abroad are called our summer because they go in summer to spend. So they, you are a cleaner here, you're doing your job. Yes, we respect your hustle. But when you go to spend in Uganda, oh my God, you spend big. And people think, wow, what are the rest of you doing there? So and so's child has come. My God. See how they're spending. And then you say, I, I, I know a couple. They were on a YouTube t television, you know, like, and I watched it. If I didn't know them, and I just saw that, you have they are millionaires here, which is okay, it's their money. However, however, we need to think of the future. We need to think of how we are spending. So now that relationship, me, my family knows when I go, I say, this is all, this is all I can afford. Oh, I, I said, I can't do. Yeah, I, this is what I can do. This is what I can afford. And I can't afford that and I can't do that. I'm very, very honest. My family knows. So we need to mend that relationship and be honest because they are always taking, taking, taking. And why I don't blame them is because of the relationship we created. We provide, we give. Because when you say, oh, 30 pounds in the Ugandan economy, come go a long way. And you give somebody. So we are enabling them to ask, ask, ask. So what I do, I give people, I, I've got, fortunately for me, I've got two friends, one who has a hair salon and one who has a bakery. So when you ask for money, I say, no, I'm sending you to a school to acquire a skill. And then I'll buy, either buy you a cooker to start baking bread or whatever you've learned. Or you learn how to make hair. I'll, I'll ask my friend to give you a, whatever in a salon. So no more money, unless it's an emergency, unless it's a family loss or something. No more freebies from me. So if you can afford to look after yourself, good. If you can't, that's my option. So um, then the other thing is, um, of course, Barbara talked about date. We can't run away from date. You can't, especially in this country. In Africa, you can try because, because you've borrowed from people, people who you know or whatever. But here, you can't run away from, you can't run away from British gas and go to whatever, United Utilities. They keep a track on you. So whatever you do, you must have, you must pay your debt and you must make a good payment plan. I remember Barbara talked about debt and I'm, I know debt personally. I've only just become debt free in the last about three years because I was going through what everybody is going through and I needed money. So I borrowed. But I remember one credit card I got when my, my daughter, when I was pregnant, 
I paid it off when my daughter was eight years. That's when I paid it off. And yes, and it was only about 7K. But because of my bad, yeah, my bad paying habits, eight years. So imagine how much money they made out of me because I was only paying interest just to keep them quiet. So please, you can't run away from debt. You have to pay it because it leaves an awful track record. And when you want to do buy something, when you finally want to buy a house, it becomes a, it becomes hell to get a mortgage. It becomes hell to get any proper credit. So please just keep a tag on your debt. And um, I've talked about clearly understanding what you're getting yourself into. If you want to buy something, whatever it is, get an expert to explain things to you. Because you don't want to be, you, you don't know. I know um, a Congolese organization who bought a building. When they bought the building, they didn't know that there was a little piece of land behind the building that was their responsibility. And this is a place where a gang used to meet and they used to destroy it all the time. And it was their responsibility and it cost them a lot of money. But because they didn't understand when they were buying the, the church, it took a while for them to, and a, a while and a lot of money to kind of fence it off, the legalities. Oh my God, it was a big, big job. And I learned from that. I learned from that because it kind of sucked the joy out of they are buying that uh, piece of land. And also, um, support. So to become finance, financially resilient, you can't do it on your own. You need support. Like I said, me, I've got a good support network. Yeah, And once I, well, we need to know who can support us and what they're capable of doing. We also need to know what's going on around us. For example, what can your organization, so if you're a woman living in Oldham, Sony is helping people. We're helping women with so many things as some of you might know, some of you might not. During the lockdown, during COVID, we we got, um, we were lucky. I think we gave women, we gave away almost um, 250,000 pounds to women, individual grants. And it was extended everywhere, even Liverpool. So if you don't, if you keep yourself to yourself and you don't know such opportunities, so you miss out because each woman got, we, we had women who got from between 500 and 1,800 pounds individually. So if you don't know what's going on in your, around you, you miss out. And, and local councillors, look, there's always a bit of money to help people. And in the community, for example, I'll speak for Oldham. If you want to start a small business, there's help for you. If you want to go back to school, there's help for you. So. Let's take advantage of all the help out there. Let's exhaust as much as we can. And I, I mean within reason what is relevant to you. And please only bite what you can chew. Because you, you might be overtly ambitious and you put your hands everywhere. You end up in a pitfall. So, um, so before I finish, I just want to have a little recap about healing. It's very, very important for us to heal. And you cannot heal until you address the wound. So for me, what I'd like us to talk, talk about here now as a group, I don't know how much time we've got left. What, are, what, what was your childhood like? What's your relationship with money? We've got loads. We've got lots of time. Good. Mm -hmm. what's, what's your relationship with money? And how can you help to change or build on it? If you're, 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 so, so this financial resilience, let's look at it as, childhood behavior. So many times the way you you are raised impacts on how you, you behave. And the, the, the same is with money. So what, what can you do to change? What can you do to add? What good practices did you see growing up? Because where we come from, there's no benefits. Everybody you see with the car, these days there's their mortgages and higher purchase. When I was growing up, everybody you see who has built their house, it is theirs. It is their house. If you see somebody driving an old banger, it is their car. There is no debt on it. So how can we get that and bring it over here? And what can you see here that you can take? Because we have, we have some of us have the opportunity to live in two economies. What can you do? What can you take from here and use in Africa? And what can you take 
from Africa that might be applicable here. I know a man who um, he buys ex hair extensions and that's all he lives off. He goes all over the world, buys from China, buys from India, buys from wherever. That's his job. And he's self-employed and he's thriving. That's what he, so he knows how to play different markets. So what can we do to become financially resilient? And even if you don't have papers, because some people have not had the opportunity to have papers yet. But if you have the papers, you have twice the, oppo the, the opportunity. If you don't, yes, you can still do things. You can still do things around you. You can still change your life. You can still impact other people's lives. So I am here to support, as Julie knows, I'm happy to support anybody as far as I can help to change their lives. Anybody. I have so much time. You want to do something? Run. Connect. Like already. <laughs> Go all at once. I know it. I'll show it. If I, if I know it, I'll show you how to do it. Even if it's you coming and copying exactly what I'm doing in Son, and even replicating it in Oldham, where I live, I'll be still be happy because it means I can come and borrow 50 pounds from you. That's all it means. In the end, I can come for 50 pounds. So thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. God bless you. Oh my God, that's amazing. Yeah. Oh, I know I can borrow 5,000 pounds from you. Eh? See, see, <laughs> you can borrow 50, yeah, borrow 5,000. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, someone say, someone here says, really, well, I need help, please. Hey, we will ask Madame, Mrs. Sally, to give us a way that you can connect, that she's comfortable with, so, so that you can reach out. But you've asked us a very, very important question, Rose, and I'd like to kickstart the conversation around it. And I'd encourage you all to be quite honest with yourself and with this safe space and share. I grew up in a predominantly single parent uh, kind of family, but it was extended because my grandmother raised me for a while because my mom was a teenage mom. And uh, so my mom went back to school and my ma I told my grandma was my mother. For a while, my grandma was a hustler. She had a market stall, and every morning we would go to the garden, do some digging, get some stuff, take it to the market. And uh, so I grew up thinking that that you know, in order to make money, you had to work so hard. That was literally almost embedded in me as a little thought. There was also a lot of dissing rich people. Rich people are mean. Rich people are nasty. Rich people are bad. Rich people. Right across the road from where we lived was a rich Muslim guy with five wives. And uh, and they had a proper fence. In Africa, the fence is a wall. Like it's like it's like a prison, but it's a wall. And um, and and at the time, even going into that compound was like going into heaven. And those children were really really arrogant. They actually were nasty. They'd be mean to you when they met you going to school. They'd kick you about for no reason. So I thought rich people and their children are nasty people. So that was now embedded in me. So number one, money is very hard to come by. You have to work too hard to get it. And uh, rich people are nasty. That was my relationship with money. When I grew up, I did law. I did my master's. I was going to make money. But at the back of my mind and in my soul, my soul knew money is not hard to come by and money is if I'm not mean. But my mind, my brain, my body had those thoughts. So that was my money mindset. And I can tell you, I was working on it. Like seriously hard to make the money. And uh, then the money was resisting me because I was walking towards the rich people that are hard, that are mean, that are nasty. Because I was making some serious money as a lawyer in Uganda. There was always that resistance when, you know, when you make money and somehow there are all these things that take the money away and you still end up with more money than money, even though you're making the money. To all intents and purposes. And then I came to the UK. And then I went down to the very bottom of the pecking the food chain and the work chain. And I'm not going to, I'm not sugarcoating it because that's what we, most of us do. When we come here, I, I went into care work. I did some cleaning. So I took off my legal degrees and did that. And so for a long time, I stayed there. 
because now my money mindset caught up with me. So I was working three, four jobs and the money was never enough. And so I carried on thinking now the politicians are nasty, the white people are nasty, the, the rich people are nasty. I was adding to my money mindset. And a lot of you have that same mindset. So I've been very open and honest with you about my money mindset. Circa 15 years ago. And then I, I, I walked away from my job. See, my mindset was following me. Your actions, your thoughts, your actions will always follow your thoughts. I walked away from a corporate job because after a while I got into, I got training into housing. I started working in housing. I got a very nice job in, in construction. I was making some money. And uh, because white people are bad, they're racist, they don't treat us nice. I walked away from a job. I literally walked away. I wasn't fired. I walked away. And then I saw days for three years. Three straight years. I applied for care jobs. I wasn't even getting care jobs, guys. Mindset. Money mindset. Then I started my own business. Ah. And uh, I started in, in marketing. I started learning about money. I started hearing from people who had this, who are talking about money mindset. And I was like, what the heck is money? My money is money. You go, you work, you make money. And you work hard and money doesn't grow on trees and you work hard to make money and they had and, and they were like, no. The people I was learning from were like, yes, we, we work to make money, but completely erase that work hard and just say work. Because when you say you have to work hard, that becomes your norm. That becomes your it's your story, you're declaring, you're saying it becomes your story. And uh, and they said, yes, money grows on trees. And I was like, what the heck? These people are crazy. Like, like I'm, why am I listening to them? But these people have money. And I was like, well, if they're saying it grows on trees, show me the money tree. And they said, the money tree is right here. Inside of you. In your, your soul knows you're rich beyond measure, infinitely rich. But does your brain, did it get the memo? Did your brain get the memo? Is it in class with your soul? Are you aligned with your infinite rich soul? Because whatever you choose, you get. And the emphasis is choose. Because the Lord is your shepherd, you shall not lack. If you keep saying, I want something, you'll never get it. Because you want it. You want it. The other word for want is lack in that good book. The Lord, my shepherd, I shall not lack. In other version is, I shall not want. So, money mindset, very important. So, I was very excited when Rose talked about that. I've had a mountain to climb, and I'm calling it mountain very loosely because that also then means you know you have it's very hard to change where my head is at when it comes to people with money, when it comes to money, when it comes to how I attract my money. I now don't even believe that I have to work hard to make it. I believe I attract what comes to me, whether I work for it or someone gives it to me or Rose gives me a uh, uh, five hundred pounds for free. I'll take it because I attract what I am right here. Your head, your heart connection. So that's my chair. Please do chair openly where your money mindset is at. Because if there's nothing else you want to leave with today, leave with the lessons Barbara has taught you to practically come and dig yourself out of the financial hole. Uh, and secondly, that money mindset, all the things Rosa said. What are you tolerating? Ask yourself that question. What am I tolerating? Financially, physically, socially, economically, what are you tolerating? Because despite the recession, financial crisis, cost of living crisis, inflation, there are people who are thriving. They are killing it, man. Why aren't we in that place? Mindset. Please, somebody say something. I told you I can speak for England. Um, Rachel, I think people are muted. Does somebody wants to speak or are we going to be shy today? I can share a bit of um, personal experience, but it was more of around debt mm -hmm. as, 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 as I was growing up. Uh, one of my parents was a banker. If not, both of them at the start were bankers. But... As we grew up, obviously one of them was a banker and 
my first exposure and knowledge of debt was when they came to our home and they wanted to close off the home. We didn't know that it had been put in as security. You know, as a young girl, around 10, 11, around there. I think it was so much of a scary experience. Uh, eventually, they settled for the car. I, I remember it was the first car we owned then. And I think they went in the living room and they got, you know, those small TVs we used to have by then. They were on vogue and all that. And they took them forever. But I remember the tears, the scary process at that age, not knowing exactly what was happening. And that kind of embedded in me the importance of family knowing what is happening around, especially regarding things like money, including debt. Um, that is the only memory I remember because I was still a young girl. So when I realized it had all got to do with debt, I grew up with a fear of debt. And incidentally, my first job back home was in microfinance and I was lending people debt. Small loans. And I now got exposed to the impact of when debt is mismanaged. Because for some of us who are coming from Africa, if you know the practice of microfinance where people end up borrowing from each microfinance. They borrow from you, they pay the other one. They can't borrow from the other one, they pay. You know, it ended up, it was very good for those who benefited out of it. But at some point in time, there are people who mismanaged it. And they can kind of, it became a game. They come, you give them money, they use it to pay the other one. And then you go after them. And then, so we, I was exposed to so, so many scenarios. And I realized when you get in into debt, you need to be intentional in paying back because I saw firsthand experience the pain it brings to the wider families where sometimes you had to go and maybe confiscate things to be able to sell off to recover that money and the pain it would leave on people's faces and all that. It's the biggest bit of my job that I hated, that I had to move quick into the accounting section because that meant I wasn't in, in the field lending and training. And even though it was enjoyable seeing those who had thrived out of that. So I've always carried that at the back of my mind that when you get debt, be intentional in paying back. And if you have to be on schedule, pay it back as soon as possible. Sometimes circumstances are unavoidable. You will not have to pay because it happened to some people. You know, you would they would play around, but eventually they failed and you would see the pain that would come that would impact the wider family. So I realize it is important that to involve the household because sometimes we are like, if I can get debt, my husband shouldn't know. He does, he, he, he's not in the picture. It is me getting it. But the impact of debt like it or not, will always affect everyone, especially when it goes into bad debt. So that is one of my experiences regarding debt or finances as a young child growing up. That was my experience. It was quite a scary experience at that time. So it always hangs around my head. It's, it's one of the memories that very, very vivid. They came and took away that Audi. I think they were Audi cars, yellow. I remember the, the, the color of the car and everything. It was a it was a present possession for the family. And for a long time, it was not replaced because there was that impact of debt. So I think that is what I can share. I also shared in the in the in the chat that. I was a son volunteer since time immemorial. I've worked with Rose when the work of son was in the living room where you don't even see where you're going, but then you stick in there. Many people shy away from volunteering, but there are benefits if you're intentional. There is so much you pick on. And part of what I picked on was how to run an organization, how to start an organization. We are still working together. I run Prosper, but 
for those very many years, that was a learning platform. And I'm happy to say that she was one of my mentors among the other mentors that I have. So there is always that journey that you walk together and then you're not looking at how much money is in the bank account because it was not there. It wasn't there. There are meetings we had where we could, as long as we had a meal with women around, that was enough. Bring and share. So that has been... Sometimes we met in McDonald's and yeah. they used to us just sit there without even buying food. <laughs> so that has been part of the journey and see where son is this day and age. There are testimonies that are coming through there. Rose has a big heart and sometimes she forgets that that heart is really, really big. But along the way, she supported many women and many of us with lived experience. There is always fear. I can't do it because nobody tells you how to do it. So when you land on somebody who gives you with her whole heart and tells you this is what you're supposed to do, she's quite busy. So mm -hmm. always be willing to be that student who will go and do research as well and be able to build on what you've got rather than expecting because culture-wise, sometimes we expect everything to come on a silver platter and that's not putting in our own effort. She tells you do this and this. We mentioned here, education is very key. You do build on that. And before you know it, there is a lot we can still do. There is a lot until you step out. No one will ever tell you that this and this is available. It was never part of much of our culture. Everybody wants to hide behind there. You know, I'm doing this. Nobody should know. But us who have worked in partnership, Julie and, you know, other people along the way, everybody that comes on board will always bring a skill. When Julie came with her tech, it was new to us. And we knew there is a gap. There is a gap for our community. Tech is not something we own, especially as women. Tech is not what we own easily as a community. So she found her footing there. Um, Mama Lois here has also mentioned in the, in the, you know, so many of us, but everybody has something they can add back to their community. Thank you so much. Wow, thank you, Barbara. I've learned something extra, extra. I'm always learning. Thank you, thank you so much. We have Carol, uh, your hands up. And uh, I think Sylvia B wants to say something, please. Yeah, thank you. And meet yourself. Good. Yeah, fair, fair. thank you very much. I, I would say that uh, I've, I've met Rose, I've met Julie, well, Barbara, and this Barbara will introduce me to this group. But I would want to say it's been a journey. I've learned a lot from all the three ladies. They've shared unconditionally. I've learned a lot from you guys. Thank you very much. I know Julie, in the beginning, during the pandemic, she was always on me, Kara, you can do this, Kara, you can do that. And getting somebody who can see the potential in you and yet you can't see it. I just want to say thank you. And as for Rose, I'm, I mean, she's a woman of wisdom, kind, kind woman, loving. Thank you very much. Barbara, Barbara, I don't know what to say, but I just want to say thank you as well for inviting me to this group. I'll just quickly share from my own experience growing up, and it's more of a, the Christian perspective because I grew up as a PK, a preacher's kid, and everything I know has always been about faith. Whenever we were going back to school asking for money from my father, he would say, you have to have faith in God because all financial blessings come from God. And what my parents told me that all money and financial wealth has to be aligned with the actions we do as well. Though we, we, are, we are talking about money, but our actions have to align with what God is saying. And my father has always told me, hard work and smart choices are very essential, but God provides for us. So we always have to be responsible for all the, the things we do in our lives, but God is the steward of all the resources, but we have to work diligently and make wise financial decisions. Those are some of the things I've grown up knowing and being taught by my parents because I've grown up in a Christian in a Christian background. One thing that I've learned that my father really taught me is to have a wealth mindset. Believe that you're capable of having that financial prosperity. The financial growth, you, you need to have a wealthy mindset. 
And the other thing that I've learned from my parents, a well, I'm grown up woman, is to have a, a clear kind of uh, goal set of what you want to do. Though you want the finances, we are talking about money, but then we have to have to create a roadmap on how we are going to achieve that money. We might talk about money in different ways, but we as ladies, what roadmap are we creating to achieve that money? And how are we going to keep it? So that's all my contribution I would love to give, but I want to emphasize on what Rose was saying, the community support that has really worked for me, surrounding myself with people of positive influence like Julie, Rose and Barbara, and all the other women on this group that I've met before. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you so much, that is deep. Yeah, and it's true, uh, in order to create wealth, money, attract it all, you have to have that mindset that aligns. It's all about you aligning because when you align your mindset with what you choose and desire, you walk towards it. Your actions, your thoughts, your processes, the people you are you bring into your experience, the people you choose to uh, allow to speak into you will be people who actually are where you want to be and have achieved those things and therefore you allow them to speak into you those things that will help you to grow and yesterday i posted something on facebook and someone challenged me and said uh, uh, god can use even a dog to to bring you your miracle uh, they did not get the message because i was saying if you've not got to where i want to go you can i will not let you speak into me about that thing because a lot of people have a lot of information without the actions and the, and, and, the, and the report card to back it up. So I am so excited about this conversation. What Carol says is absolutely 100% right. And what we all don't understand, and which is something that I think our preachers need to also preach, is God desires for us what we desire. The question is, how uh, is our desire and our action matching? Because you can desire something as much as you can, but if you don't move towards it, even your miracle has to come to you, you have to get off your knees to go get it. All right? So, yeah, very, very much so. I think someone wants to say something. Sylvia B., um, are you still here with us? Do you want to say something? I am. Um, hi, yourself? everyone. Hi, Sylvia. Am I okay to speak without my video? Good. Thank you. Right. So my name is Sylvia, and I would like to say thank you to Madame Rose and thank you to Barbara Bananga, you ladies. Hmm. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So thank you for this, you know, for opening up this, uh, whatever it's called, the Zoom link, the idea that you've come Super. up, you know, like to help us. People like me, uh, let me share. When when Madame Rose uh, asked the question, what is your relationship with money? Like, how did you grow up? You know, like your background with money, that really got to my heart. Now, when I was growing up, I, I uh, grew up in a family where my dad is a businessman. Uh, he used to work in Chikubo, the Ugandans will know that place. The, the, the market area, that place in Chikubo, it's a business area where it is full of people that have got money. Now, in that place, I used to go there during holidays, like in senior Fovac. Every time, in fact, we went, we were in holidays. Our dad never wanted us to stay home. So he used to say, just go to town and work. If you want to get money, you have to work for it. Uh, so we used to go there. Now, unfortunately for me, every time I saw this, you know, millions of money being, you know, like we used to sell things. In, we used to sell like you could get like at the end of the day, like five, six millions in just a day or even more. And oh, tell you what, it. my ignorance, it told me that's in Ugandan shillings. My ignorance told me that's money there to be spent. Now, I never had this experience or this uh, what's it called? The culture, the saving culture, which is something that I would like to share. Now, I really suffered a terrible disease because me, every time I saw money, I used to think I've got to buy something. I've got to buy a pair of shoes. I've got to buy that nice bag. I've got to get that dress. It, I've got to wear it. You know, where you, you see things and you have to spend it just because you have the money, just because the money is there. 
unfortunately, they never taught us the saving culture. And I'm, I, it's something that I've, uh, through my friends that are, they've always said, you know, how do you keep money? How do you, do you save? Some, some people will ask me, do you save? Have you got to, you know, do you keep money aside? Now, before I didn't, until I married my husband. God, he can't save. He doesn't spend something that he does not need. In fact, it's through him that I learned the meaning of the two words. I want and I need. Remember when I went to the shop and I just wanted to buy something and he said to me, do you need it? I went, what? Do you need it? And I and I thought, I, I want to have it. Yeah, he said, yeah, you want it, but you don't need it. And I thought, okay. He went back at the, you know, the back of my head and I thought, yeah, this is how people save. You can only save if you have a habit of buying something that you really need, not something that you want to have. So that question, you know, like it got back at, at the, at the um, my medulla oblongata and I was like, uh oh, we, <laughs> we, need to, we need to get into a culture of saving. Yeah, so uh, I've learned and I'm still on a journey and I'm so glad I've, you know, I've connected to this tonight. I haven't gone to connect, but for, for some reason I was like, let me press this, you know, press this Zoom. So I'm so happy that, thank you so much, ladies. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think that's, I, I think it's something that we also need to teach to our children, you see, like for them to grow up. Just because our parents didn't do it, it doesn't mean that we can't teach it to our children. Sometimes we, I say we Africans in quotes, we tend to think, oh, my mom never did that and I'm not going to do that. My parents never did that and I won't do that to you or for you. So we need to change. I think we need to change. Um, you you, you spoke about something, Sil, you said something about uh, a mindset, changing your mindset. I think we need to change our mindset depending on where we are the environment that we're in and how we see money. Have you ever come to this place? Let me say in your first years of coming to the UK where you got pounds and then you started converting pounds into shillings. <laughs> You're like, uh oh, this is how much I get. And you think, eh? you think you've got more money, <laughs> not knowing that the environment where you are, you are actually going to spend that money in pounds and not in shillings. <laughs> And not in shillings, you get me. So I think we need we need to change. Yeah, the mindset, our mindset should change. We're living in the UK in a pound land is where we are, and not in the shilling land. So, you know, yeah, uh, that's what I want. I'm so grateful to you, ladies. Thank you so much. My time is not wasted. Thank you. Beautiful. That's awesome. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much. I'd like to invite Martha. Martha, are you with us or are you busy somewhere? Sometimes someone's with us, but they're not with us. No, I'm here. I've been here. Oh, awesome. Uh, would you like to share? Yeah, I'd like to share. Uh, awesome. I'm glad that I had to switch into the meeting today after work. And I'm so blessed. I'm so blessed by all your, by all your deliberations. And because I've known Julie before she she started warding, I remember her words she posted on Facebook. She's like, I need to create a, a, a community of women. And when I see this in place, I'm so proud of you, Julie. You have done well. You have done well. I've, I've seen it from an idea to something that is impacting people's lives. And when they talk about money, uh, about my background, it was a bit triggering of memories, like my, my parents really that both teachers and you know how Ugandan teachers, you know, minimum pay. So it was, we grew up in debt really to pay school fees. And uh, recently when we, when we reflect with my parents, my mom said that, oh, you know, some people never used to be a guarantor for us. Every time we would go to the Chivina, like to the, to the, those circles to borrow money. Some, some of their best friends would, would run away because they knew they didn't want to sign for my parents. So, and that has been, that has motivated me to keep pushing my way through. And I want to do better than my parents. So that's my motivation. I, I look at the negative and I want to turn it to the positive. And when I came into the UK, I've had uh, the ladies talk about volunteering. 
I can, I don't know how I've jumped in uh, like from zero or from grass to grass, uh, like being in an immigrant in the UK just before I even finished five years because of, of giving my service to different organizations here in London. And it has helped me build social capital, not having a relative, but being able to, 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 to like find my way in a foreign country just because of the skills I give to different organizations. So like always begin with what you have wherever you have, and the universe will just come into play. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. That is, that is also a very powerful uh, testimony. And I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that because uh, it's not just teachers in Africa who are on minimal pay. It's almost every profession. As civil servants are all on minimal pay, going for months without getting paid. And so you wonder how they actually survive and keep showing up for their families, feeding families, feeding children. But behind all that struggle is the mindset the child grows up with regarding money. And for many, even when we change continents and we come to the land of opportunity, land of milk and honey, land of whatever we might want to call it, somehow we bring that with us. And if we don't learn to flip that switch and think about wealth creation, money, work, what we do, how we do it, who we do it with, with in a, coming from a place of joy, from a place of loving it, from a place of being excited to wake up and go do it, we get to stay like we didn't even leave Africa. And the difference is here in this country, you don't even have the family support to fall back on. So you're almost on your own, plus maybe your, your, family, your core family. And, and, and unless you find a community like we found Sown and we found Prosper and, and now Wadding, it, it becomes a difficult journey. And you wonder why I came to Europe, but why, why is my life different? Because you carried that mindset with you. So it's, it's a very deep thing, the mind. And uh, I'm so glad that many of us are, are changing that situation for ourselves and for our communities. Volunteering, volunteering. Because a lot of people don't understand that when you volunteer, you are freely giving of what you have and what you know, time or resources in terms of knowledge uh, and, and, and to, to the community. And when you give, freely, it comes back to you. Pass it down, shaken over, overflowing. I cannot tell you how much that can turn your life around. And so feel free to volunteer with uh, with Wadin if you'd like to reach out to our Rachel Barbara and have a conversation about volunteering with Wadin. We are always happy to uh, support your volunteering journey and, 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 and support your career as well. So I don't know if there, there are several comments coming up. Coming, coming, coming. Good evening, educative. Thanks for to the admin. Thanks for watching. God bless you all. Thank you, Adetutu. We appreciate you so much. Thank you for joining us. I mean, we could have been sat here by ourselves. So every single one of you that has gifted your time with us today, we truly, we truly appreciate you and we pray you are blessed. Double, double portion, triple portions. Uh, <laughs> you converted the rent from Euro to Uganda shillings. I used to do that. I used to say, hey, we are paying millions here in rent. Why don't we just go back home then? <laughs> and uh, until I had, I, again, flip that switch mindset, different continents, different country, different economies. So it's very important. It, and that also goes back to what Rose mentioned about how we need to be real about where we are and what we do here when we visit home so that we don't give people a false impression of what we can do and how we can support them. And also why people think that people who live in Europe, there is there, there seems to be some kind of money gravy train and please give, give, give us. And they give you stories of all kinds happening to them when there's absolutely nothing happening. They just want the money. And I'm using the word want here deliberately. Um, Thank you for the sessions. We appreciate you, Remy. Thank you, thank you for joining us. Thank you all for taking the time to be here in the week, in the week. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I cannot just, I cannot thank our facilitators for today enough because um, my mind has gone back to some of the lessons I've been taught. Be proud of your hustle. 
I was so angry when I was working in the corporate space. And a lot of us Black people are angry. We actually are the proverbial Black angry person. And that anger creates a, a, a total spiritual barrier around your income. It becomes your world, right? Anger is a low vibrational energy. And low vibrational energies create a barrier around us. Higher vibrational energies give us the freedom. And that's for those of you who understand science. For those of you who want to go into the spiritual side, lift your praises. Be thankful. Be grateful for what you're doing. Even if it's not what you actually choose. If you were given a choice, you would not choose it. Yet it is putting food on your table, feeding the children. You're able to send a bit of money to mommy or daddy back home. Uh, support the family but so be appreciative i was the angry black woman and i tell you i paid the price for years and uh, i wouldn't want anyone to go through that so if you are hating on your job if nothing else look away today thanking god for that job and for that means of attracting the currency it is a currency money is a currency did you ever think about why it's called currency? Because it flows from you or away from you. So in order to change the current of money to you, you need to start appreciating the means through which you attract that currency to you. Then you have more of it. God created, literally God wants, desires for you to have more. But when you don't appreciate what you've got, then there is no reason to give you more. And that means even if you change jobs tomorrow, you'll have that same energy because it, it, it takes a while for that energy to change. Um, so I'm so, so thankful. Follow the, the, the processes that Barbara has given us. They're very practical steps and they are doable. When I learned about putting aside some money so I could invest it in some, to something to something else, I decided that I was going to become a taxman mm -hmm. in my life. And I decided if Queen Elizabeth is taking 20% of what I earn every month, why shouldn't I also take 20% for myself? Not for anything else and not for a rainy day, as I said before, but for myself. What does that mean? I'm going to do something with it. I'm going to put it into something that will multiply. I'm going to use it as seed to plant to something and when I when you plant a seed you expect something to grow don't you and that's what I did and that's what I do to today I don't even think about that money like it's there it's not there for me to spend on groceries to spend on parties to spend to lend rosemary 50 quid that money I don't use it for that I use it to, to grow to plant it I plant it somewhere whether it is planting plants planting buildings, planting investments. I plant it somewhere. It's seed money. So your job, whether you're on minimum wage or you're on your maximum wage, 20, after after King Charles takes his, his because his majesty revenue and taxes, so now it's his, his taxes. After he takes 20%, give yourself 20% and plant it somewhere. So it's not for a rainy day. It is so that you can thrive, so that you can become financially resilient and seek financial advice from people that have got to where you need to be. That means people with the expertise and the time to pour into you their knowledge so you can use that seed money in a way that actually make that, that seed grow into something that you actually want to grow into. You choose it to grow into something that bears fruit, and supports your journey further. Um, and enjoy, enjoy your life. Enjoy your life. As you, wherever you are, start with where you are, with what you've got, irrespective of the cost of living crisis, you are living your life. You're not going to rewind the years and say, okay, for the, so, so, so many years we had COVID, cost of living, recession, so I am going to take back those years and live again, you know. So today, be present in your life today. And so that means, even if it means enjoying yourself, with what you've got, as Barbara said. Start from there, you know, 
There are so many free things to do. I used to take my children to the local park and we would play in the grass and we would play on the on the slides and we would play. Now there are adults that I don't think they appreciate me taking them to the local park. But guess what? I still go to the local park. Why? Because the council has put for me free gym there. There's a free gym in my local park. Eh? There are machines, there's rowing machine, there's climbing my frame, there is a uh, things for, for doing your your muscles. They, hey, there is machines for swinging on and, and working the sides. So I go to the park to enjoy myself, to fix this body beautiful and make it look even more sexy. So what is your excuse? Do what you, 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 you cannot use money as the excuse why you're not enjoying your life. Joy is an inside job. It's your job to be joyful and happy. Neither Barbara nor Rose nor anybody here will teach you joy. You have to do it yourself. And uh, please buy some books that will teach you about money. I'm going to recommend to you a couple of books. Oh, my, my son has actually bought one. There's one book here that I want to recommend to you. I don't know if you can see it, but oh, let me remove the blur from... You can see it. It's called Trust, okay? This book is called Trust by Ian Lavazant. And it's about trusting you, trusting God, or whatever you want to call that source of power and life. It's trusting the universe, nature, and it's trusting humanity. This book will give you a different way to look at life. This woman has gone through so many things that most of us would thank God we haven't gone through. And she's a multi-millionaire, probably even more than that. And she shares with us how she got out of the funk into the thrival in this book. It's about trust. Um, you, you can also read several books. Um, I've read a book called Outwitting the Devil. And uh, I'd really recommend it to you all. There's a free version on YouTube. You can just listen to it or you can buy it on Amazon. That book will also switch your mind from that, you know, that minds. Our parents taught us what they mean, but that mindset may not have helped our current money mindset. And one more book I'd like for you to think, to consider. It's called The Millions Within. We all have millions within because we live in a secular world, even if we are spiritual um, and spiritual beings. We forget the being bit and we live in the body all the time. And unless you activate the millions within, even the thousands will not come. It will continue to be more month than money for you. And I'm saying this with a very sorrowful heart because I want everybody here today to come out of that place and be in thrive for me. So today has been a very, a very deep. Uh, session and I, I'm very glad it was there are several books here that I would encourage you to read and I want you to I, I would like for you to go ahead uh, I would like for you to go ahead and, and look at those three if you have any books you'd like for me to read I'm very excited please share them in the comments all I can say is thank you my sister Barbara thank you my sister Rose thank you for pouring into us I'm so grateful for your time for your expertise for your mentorship I used to sit on this Zoom, on Zoom with Barbara till 1, 2 a.m. as we went through how to write project proposals. And then I'd sit on the other Zoom with Rose the next day and we would go through the same on how to write proposals for wording. And so the, everything I know, and I'm telling you everything I know about running a charitable organization is because of these two women. So if you have been invited to learn, to pick up, to pour, to be poured into, to, to tap, you call it what you want in whichever language, and you haven't taken that email that has been shared with you, I think someone asked for the email, and, 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 and Rose shared her email on here. Um, someone asked for it, and it's been shared. Let me, share, no one to blame let me share mine. Yourself. Please reach out to these ladies. They are very busy. I can't tell you how busy they are. <laughs> and yet, they always find time in their busy day, in their 24 hours, because we all get the same, to pour into you when you reach out and ask. It's all about asking. Uh, 
ask and you shall receive. So, oh, that's very, 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 very uh, deep stuff. Would you like a session on? Let me let me read that again. Um, because I've been asked to hold a session uh, on the practical side of running hustles and what opportunities are available. If I get more than half the hands on here saying I, I shall definitely look for a facilitator to do that. Would you like a session on the practical side of running hassles? <laughs> right. I'll call it side gigs. I'll call it uh, extra money making activities because I can tell you now, I unsubscribe from the word hustle. I am totally not in that class. Um, Yet, people still call them hassles, because for me, hassle means hard, 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 slow, hassle. Eh. So I am all about ease to manage my health. And uh, we can either turn that session into that, or we, it can be, uh, we have one more session on mental health as well. And then we have a Q&A. &A. So yes, if people, if people choose and prefer that, we will do what people choose and prefer. You're most welcome. You're most welcome, my sister, Judy. I appreciate you so much. So please give a huge clap, digital clap for Mama Rosie and Mama Barbara. We appreciate you so much. Our poverty warriors, thank you so much for calling into us and uh, just getting us to ask ourselves questions because I love that for this session, it was all about getting you to think about the things you think you know, but you don't do. Are you doing them? And if you're doing them, keep on doing because it's in that. In in my language, they say, I don't know how they say it in English, so someone help me. If you keep doing something over and over, over again, you get something from it because you're giving it your energy. and you're, you know, Practice where, makes where, perfect. That's it. Practice makes perfect. And also where your energy goes, your results flow. Hey, practice makes perfect. So practice, practice, practice. Keep doing what you're doing. If you're getting results, we have a ton load of claps for our amazing facilitators in the chat. I appreciate you, all of you. And uh, so that we can all have dinner by seven, I'm going to say, Please uh, feel free to drop off when you're ready. Uh, I said at the beginning that Warden has SIM cards for everybody who is in need of a SIM card, preloaded with data, preloaded with airtime. And we have those even that are available, that have all that for 24 months, six months, or one year. Please don't sit at home and say, I don't have data. I can't come to Zoom because I don't have data. You know, I can't go because I don't have data. You have data. It's here, it's available for you. I showed you those cards last time. Please do reach out and we'll get them to you. Thank you for joining us, every single one of you.